Good afternoon. Today I'm going to be reviewing the Alto 8 Iron X Silver. This watch is available from alto8.com for 550 US dollars. So firstly, let's look at the box that the watch comes in, and then I'll talk you through the other items one gets with a piece. So the watch comes in this green cardboard watch box. One removes the sleeve and then removes the lid. And as you can see, there are three cutouts in the foam panel in the base. So the right hand top cutout is for the head of the piece. The lower cutout is for the leather strap and the left hand top cutout is for the warranty card and owner's instruction manual. So nice presentation, but a disappointment bearing in mind the price point of the piece. This is a mid-tier piece at 550 US dollars. We're not looking at a low-tier piece below 300 US dollars. So although the presentation is good and the design is good, I would like to see at this price point either a solid wooden watch box or alternatively a plastic watch box which is vinyl coated, something higher standard than this cardboard watch box. With regards to the items, this is the owner's instruction manual. Clear concise diagrams, the instructions are in English and it details the operation of the movement used, which is the Miyota Caliber 82S7 automatic. This is the warranty card and I'm pleased to report the watch is covered by a two year international warranty. And lastly, one also gets this tag. And on the reverse, we have the barcode and the full reference number of the Iron X Silver. So with regards to the specifications of the piece, this is the Alto 8 Iron X Silver. We have a 46mm case diameter, we have a 47.7mm lug to lug measurement, a thickness of 12.6mm and a lug width of 22mm. The genuine leather strap tapers from 22mm at the lugs down to the buckle and tang and as you can see the buckle is signed with the Alto 8 brand emblem on the left. Good heavy gauge to the stainless steel buckle and no sharp edges, no burrs, beautiful luster to the 316L grade stainless steel. Two keepers on the genuine leather strap, one is fixed, one slides. So the first keeper is bonded, I'll show you the underside. As you can see the first keeper is bonded into position and the second keeper can float up and down the strap as one would expect. Good quality leather strap and they've made the correct decision by using quick release stainless steel spring bar so one doesn't need a spring bar tool in order to exchange the strap. Good quality stitching to the underside and the underside has this tan lining to it, plenty of holes in it to allow for fine tuning the length. It will fit up to a 7.5 inch wrist. It's tapered in thickness, thicker at the spring bar end and gradually tapers down to the buckle and tang end and also tapers in width from 22mm down to the buckle and tang. Now it is a padded strap and it is very stiff but I'm confident with daily wear it's going to break in and become very soft and supple and therefore comfortable. Nice attention to detail with the three stripes of stitching and no loose stitches, the quality of the stitching and the quality of the leather is very high grade. With regards to the rest of the specification, we have a flat sapphire crystal with clear AR coating on the underside. The clear anti-reflective coating does a good job of reducing the glare and the highly reflective nature of these skeletonized bridges to the movements, which is the Miyota Caliber 82S7. So I like the symmetry to the dial. Now they've made the correct decision by using a full chapter ring. Often it's the case with skeletonized dials and skeletonized movements. With the absence of a dial, the chapter ring is also skeletonized and therefore there's nowhere to put the applied indices. Using the full chapter ring, which is indexed with white minute ticks, improves the legibility. And they've also inlaid applied indices into the full chapter ring. So that means that we've got 12 indices as well as 60 minute ticks. So the legibility is good despite it being skeletonized. And there's also a good differentiation between the longer minute hand and also the hour hand, which is an arrowhead tip. So one can clearly orientate the dial and tell the difference between the hour hand and the minute hand. They are completely different designs. So fully skeletonized, it does a good job of showing off the caliber 82S7. And also we have subdial. So if you look at the nine o'clock subdial, which is difficult to read, that is a day and night indicator. And I'll just move the minute hand out of the way to show you better. If you look at the five o'clock position, we also have a scale which goes from zero, zero up to 20. So this is actually for the second hand. Now, rather than having a conventional second hand, which is driven off the cannon pinion in the center of the movement, what we have is a subdial register at the five o'clock position. So you can see that we have a three pointed star with three triangular loom tips on the three pointed star. 
and the three-pointed star continually rotates at 60 seconds per revolution. So one tip of the three-pointed star moves along the scale from 0 seconds to 20 seconds and then the next point of the three-pointed star begins again. So it constantly runs 0 to 20, 0 to 20 over and over again. So it does take some getting used to because in order to read the time, uh, the seconds, one has to look at the three-pointed star and look at the 0 to 20 second uh, register. Once it gets to 20, one of course has to go back to 0. I think this would have been better had they used a full circle for a subdial and had the three-pointed star rotating on a 60 second uh, rotation on a full circle rather than this 0 to 20, but I appreciate they're trying to come up with something different and it's really a novelty. It's there for decorative purposes rather than being functional because of course once one gets past 20 seconds, 25, 30, 35 seconds, there is no register. So the second scale only works from 0 to 20, which I think is a, a negative. So with regards to the Auto 8 uh, emblem uh, or the brand logo at 3 o'clock, you can see they've added that. And the symmetry is good and I think that the layout is good. The legibility of the skeletonized minute hand is good due to the large proportion of it. And it does extend all the way to the 60 minute ticks and the 12 applied indices. Now, with regards to the case back, it's a screwed down stainless steel case back, which provides an effective hermetic seal to 50 meters of water resistance, which is perfectly acceptable. Nicely engraved, and we also have a window which is glazed with mineral crystal, and that displays the balance wheel. And when the rotor spins round, one can also see the rotor passing. So, the Caliber 82S7 is an open heart movement, and of course, if you look through the window in the screw down case back, you can see all the way through the balance wheel through to the front crystal, which is sapphire crystal. So that's the benefits of using the 82S7. It is an open heart movement. One can see all the way through the balance wheel from front to back. So nice attention to detail, brush satin finish to the screw down case back, four flat head screws and they've done a nice job of mirror polishing a bevel all the way around the perimeter and the mirror polishing is done very good, no sharp edges, no burrs, perfectly flat so it sits very close to the wrist. Now this is subjective but I think that they should have deleted this also 8 engraving on the left hand flank. I dislike heads of pieces when they have the watch brand engraved on the left hand flank. I think it cheapens the look, uh, but this is subjective. Some collectors might like having the brand name engraved in large fonts on the left hand flank. The head, the flank of the case is matte bead blasted as is the, the rest of the head of the piece. The top of the case is a brass satin finish which contrasts with it. So the centre section of the case is bead blasted and the case back is brass satin finish which matches the longitudinal brass satin finishing to the top of the case. Solid 316L grade stainless steel bezel, nice chamfer machine to it which is mirror polished and that complements the bevel around the perimeter of the top of the head of the piece. So the finishing to the head of the piece is very good, uh, bearing in mind the price point and the contrasting finishes add interest to it because we've got brass satin finish to the top, brass satin finish to the case back and that contrasts with the bead blasting to the midsection and the mirror polished bevels and also chamfer to the bezel. So well finished case, no sharp edges, no burrs to it and we've also got crown guards which protect the push pull crown. So with the gloss of the crown, solid 316L grade stainless steel, coin edge finished, and it's also engraved with the Alter 8 brand emblem to a good standard. So let's test the push-pull crown execution. It provides 50 meters of hermetic seal, which is perfectly acceptable for a daily wear piece. So as it's a push-pull crown rather than a screw down crown in the closed position, one can manually wind the Miota Caliber 82S7 to top it up to its maximum 42 hour power reserve. It feels smooth to manually wind. One can feel the tension in the mainspring gradually building up. It's not as smooth as a Seiko NH35A. It does feel very similar to a Miyota Caliber 8215. And of course, the architecture of the 82S7 is the same as the 8215. The 82S7 is a skeletonized version of the 8215. So they feel exactly the same. There's no discernible difference between the 82S7 and the 8215 respectively. Now, there's no date complication, so pulling it out to the first click is the final click position, and we're now in the time setting position. Early versions of this movement, the 82S7, did not have hacking. One couldn't stop the movement dead. This is a later version of the 82S7, and if you look at the second hand 
uh, subdial at the five o'clock position. If you look at the scale, you can see the three pointed star has now stopped dead. So this is a later version with hacking, which is a benefit. So with regards to setting it, it does feel very similar to the 8215, which you'll be familiar with. Unfortunately, it does have the same characteristic. There is some back play. Now, if you look at the crown closely, you can see I'm now rotating it clockwise and anti-clockwise. But look at the minute hand. The minute hand isn't responding, even though I'm rotating the crown. There is significant back play, and this is a characteristic of the 8215. And of course, this is also a characteristic of this 82S7, which is the skeletonized version. So it has more back play than a Seiko NH35A or an NH38. And that's something I dislike about Miyota movements, the 8000 series, the 8215 and this 82S7 respectively. One has to rotate the crown more clockwise and anti-clockwise to take up the back play. Now it does feel smooth clockwise and anti-clockwise and it is easy to set the time. It does feel um, there's minimal resistance to the gearing. There's not a lot of friction. I personally prefer the NH38 and the NH35A because they feel tighter, There's, it feels more solid. With the 8215 and also this 82S7, it does feel lighter. So pushing it back in restarts the movement, as you can see. The three-pointed start on the 0 to 20 second scale on the uh, subdial at 5 o'clock begins to rotate again. So it works okay. The pushable crown works okay to provide 50 meters, which is acceptable. Right, so I'll give you a wrist shot and you can see how it fits on my 8 inch wrist. Now this strap will fit up to a 7.5 inch wrist. As you can see, it's slightly too short for my 8 inch wrist uh, to engage in both of the keepers. If this were half an inch longer, it would suffice for an 8 inch uh, wrist. But for a 6 to 7 inch wrist, for the majority of collectors, even up to a 7.5 inch wrist, this leather strap will suffice. So as you can see, 46 millimeter head of the piece, it does have a lot of wrist presence and it does have a lack of heft. It's only 111 grams on this leather strap. So it does feel top heavy because of course we have a large square head of the piece, 46 millimeters diameter uh, by 47.7 lug to lug. The 47.7 lug to lug is very close to perfection, which is 48 millimeters, but unfortunately it's perfectly flat and square. It doesn't curve and wrap around the wrist like a tonneau case. So I think that Alto 8 could have improved the underside and made a curved undercut to the underside of the flank and also curved the case back. Because if you look, one does get a gap underneath the angular lugs and also underneath the flat case back. Um, so it could be improved. In terms of comfort, it feels like it's sitting on the wrist like a square slab of 316L grade stainless steel rather than curving and wrapping around the wrist like a curved tonneau case. So the comfort is okay, but I think for 8 to 12 hours per day, it would become uncomfortable. Even though it's only 111 grams for a 46 millimeter large piece, purely because it's top heavy, it doesn't feel very well balanced despite having a 22 millimeter lug width and the strap tapering from 22 down to the buckle and tang. So top heavy piece. Now it is aesthetically pleasing. If you like modern designs of watches and you like skeletonized dials, of course you're going to appreciate this contemporary design. It's interesting, it's something different and I appreciate that Alto 8 have come up with an original design rather than producing on homage. I do like the way the chamfer on the stainless steel bezel is mirror polished and catches the light and that also complements the large mirror polished bevel to the top edge of the head of the piece. So the finishing to the case is very aesthetically pleasing and also it's an interesting case to look at because we have the contrast of the longitudinal brass satin finishing contrasting with the matte bead blasted centre section to the flanks. So interesting piece to look at. Legibility is good because we have the applied indices in the full chapter ring and we have the large minute hand and also the large arrowhead tipped to the hour hand, so easy to read the time. So not very comfortable and it does feel top heavy despite the lack of heft. Right, so let's do a loom test and we'll see how the loom performs when it's charged up to the absolute maximum. So as always, I'm going to use my 100 UV LED torch to charge it up to the absolute peak. Right, so that's now fully charged, and as you can see, interesting choice of loom. We've got both BGW9 Super Loom Nova and also C3 Super Loom Nova. So on this X portion of the skeletonized dial, we have the BGW9, which is glowing in a blue tone, and that contrasts with the C3 Super Loom Nova used on the applied indices. And they've also used C3 on the minute ticks, which is a surprise. 
Now, as you can see, it's easy to differentiate between the longer minute hand and also the arrowhead tip to the hour hand. The applied indices look very good. They've clearly used five to six layers, and I appreciate it's difficult to apply five to six layers because it has a skeletonized dial. So they've used the correct decision, making a full chapter ring rather than skeletonized and applied indices recessed into the chapter ring to give enough depth on the indices to apply five to six. Now, on the four corners, on the underside of the case back, we have uh, four flathead screws. And to add interest to the top of the case, they've also engraved and fully loomed the tops of the screws, as you can see. And um, they've inlaid them with blue luminova. Now, this isn't BGW9 on the four corners of the case. It's some kind of blue luminova. I don't think it's super luminova, but it does add interest to it. So legibility is surprisingly good, bearing in mind it's skeletonized and one can easily read the time. The C3 on the applied indices is glowing brightly, although on the skeletonized hands it's fading quicker. Now I appreciate it's difficult to apply five to six layers on the skeletonized hands because they don't allow for a lot of depth. It looks like three to four layers on the hour and minute hand, but five to six layers on the indices. You can see the indices are glowing brighter and glowing longer. And if you look at the three pointed star on the five o'clock subdial, the second register, you can see the luminova is glowing very well on that, the super luminova. Uh, it looks like five to six layers on the three pointed star going from zero to 20 seconds, which really, as I've discussed, is for decorative purposes rather than being able to read the seconds. So I would describe the loom performance as OK. Right, so let's discuss the movement used. So this uses the Miyota Caliber 82S7, which is a skeletonized version of the 8215. It's a reliable, well-proven workhorse skeletonized movement. It has 21 joules. It runs at 21,600 vibrations per hour and a frequency of 3 hertz. 42-hour power reserve is perfectly acceptable. It has hand winding and hacking. Now, as I've detailed, early versions of the 82S7 did not have hacking, so it's a notable improvement that Alterator using the later version of the 82S7, which does hack. The stated accuracy of the 82S7 is minus 20 to plus 40 seconds per day, so rather wide accuracy range. However, this one is well regulated and it's running consistently at plus 8 seconds per day, which is certainly within the minus 20 to plus 40 stated accuracy. Plus 8 is perfectly good enough. Now, there are some negatives to the 82S7 movements. The two main negatives are the noisy rotor. The architecture of the 82S7 is based upon the 8215, and a characteristic or a negative of the 8215 is it has a noisy rotor. One can hear the rotor spinning around both clockwise and anticlockwise when worn on wrist. And as this is based upon the 8215, it's a skeletonized version of it, it has the same negative problem. The rotor is noisy. The other negative is it's a unidirectional winding movement. So the rotor can spin clockwise and anticlockwise, but unfortunately it only winds the movement when it's rotating anticlockwise. When the rotor spins clockwise, it has negligible winding effect. So in order to keep this fully wound to 42 hours, one has to wear the watch for 8 to 12 hours per day. It's not as efficient as a bidirectional winding movement. Alternatively, one has to put it on a watch winder for 1,200 turns per day. Alternatively, one has to top it up by manually winding it. Now, from when the movement is stopped dead, when the mainspring is exhausted fully, 40 clockwise turns of the crown is enough to fully wind a caliber 82S7. The same applies to the caliber 8215. 40 full clockwise turns will manually wind it to its maximum 42 hours. So you have those three options. Put it on an automatic winder for 1,200 turns per day, wear the watch for 8 to 12 hours per day, alternatively give it 40 full turns from dead stop, and that will wind it up to the maximum. So noisy rotor, unidirectional winding, they are the main negatives, but the other negative has been resolved. The early versions didn't have hacking. This does have hacking because it's the latest version of the 82S7. It's a reliable, well-proven skeletonized movement, so really the only negative is um, the noisy rotor and, of course, it's unidirectional. But, however, at $550, US I would expect to see a higher grade of movement used. Right, so lastly, I'll summarize the piece. What do I think of it overall? Well, when I'm considering reviewing a watch on my channel, the watch me two criteria, it should be both excellent quality and excellent value at the respective price point. $550 US makes this a mid-tier piece. 
I consider it to be good quality, but I consider the value to be poor. I can't say the value is good and I can't say the value is excellent because this does face some stiff competition at 550 US dollars within the mid tier. 550 US dollars will buy you a Swiss made piece with a Swiss made movement such as the Salita SW200-1. So I don't think it's good enough to use a Japanese Miyota Caliber 82S7 in this watch. It really needs a higher grade of movement in order to be competitive within the mid-tier at the $550 US price point. So the quality of the finishing to the bezel, the head of the piece, and also the case back is all good. So I have to say it's good quality. The quality of the leather strap is also good. Quality control, builds quality and finishing throughout are all good. But however, I have to say the value is poor at 550. I think Auto8 needs to lower the price from 550 to circa 350 US dollars in order to make this more competitive. If this piece were 350, then yes, I would say it was good quality and good value. But bear in mind, this is competing with Sega Design and Sega Design are producing very similar cases and case designs, contemporary uh, with skeletonized movements and also skeletonized dials. So it does face some strong opposition from Sega Design and of course their watches are significantly less expensive. So I'm going to recommend it to you for consideration but bear in mind the shortcomings of the movements which I think is low grade. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed my review of the Alter 8 Iron X Silver. Please feel free to post your own comments below the video. Thank you very much.